Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 88. Hit the road, Jack. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, my creative and inspired co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm doing okay. How are you? Doing all right. This is our post-vacation, post-election episode here today. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, got a number of stories to get through here with uh, the week off that we had. Mm Mm-hmm. So in our Disney Detective, we're going to be talking about a virtual D23 event that's coming up. Uh, Then we'll talk about whether Jack Sparrow's days are numbered with Disney. In our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, we'll find out what did Yoda really know? Mm. Who did he know? (laughs) Right. And why George made changes in the special edition. Something that's always been controversial. Mm Mm-hmm. Then in our entertainment news, we will discuss a character that Stan Lee forgot that he was the co-creator of, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a beloved character in the MCU now. And we'll take a look at the Orville starting up production. Then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Before we do that, I would invite folks to uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can get the video versions of our podcasts. Uh, listed as Insights into Things. You can get the audio versions uh, listed as Insights into Entertainment. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and Amazon. Uh, I would also invite folks to reach out to us. Give us your feedback. Tell us what you'd like us to talk about, what you'd like us not to talk about. <clears throat> you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at Insights Into Things. We are on uh, Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast, or you can catch links to all of those things, plus all of our shows on our website at insightsintothings.com. Ready to get started? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So coming up this week, uh, D23, which is the Disney fan club, uh, is actually going to be doing a virtual event. Um, This is the first one I think that they've uh, done, and it's uh, the Fantastic World Celebration. It's a five-day event uh, starting on Monday. Um, and they have uh, two panels each day that they're going to be doing. Um, now, for most of them, you can either go to d23.com, uh, facebook.com backslash d23, or youtube.com backslash d23 to watch. I'm guessing after uh, they they show the um, panels, I'm guessing they'll still be available to view on YouTube. There was nothing that actually said if they were just going to be available for that time period or if they were going to be, um, you know, posting afterwards. So we'll obviously have to, to wait and see on that. Um, for the most part, again, all of them are free. 
Uh, to have a D23 membership, a general membership, it's actually free. You can just log on and, and create an account. Um, there are two of the events that are for gold members only. So for that, for a D23 gold membership, you actually do have to, to pay for that. Um, and if you do have a D23 gold, you can actually go onto the website to register to get a code for these two special panels that they have. Um, so on Monday, the two panels that they have, uh, the first one is uh, the Fantasia Legacy, a conversation with Eric Goldberg. Uh, that will be at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. And it's in celebration of the 80th anniversary of Fantasia and the 20th anniversary of Fantasia 2000. And it says, uh, enjoy a special retrospect with master animator, uh, Eric Goldberg of the Walt Disney Animation Studio, one of the key creators of Fantasia 2000. Then uh, an hour later at 3 p.m. Pacific or 6 p.m. Eastern, it's Star Wars Galaxy's Edge storytelling through merchandise. <laughs> So you, so you can log on and see all the stuff that, you know, you either have or want to have. Um, and it's meet the Disney team, uh, meet the Disney theme park merchandising team who helps to bring Batu to life as they explore the rich storytelling that goes into the exotic and authentic imports of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So that's for Monday. Then on Tuesday, uh, the two panels that they have, then they kind of switch gears and they go to Marvel themes. So the first one is Marvel 616 Uncovered. Um, and it's get an exclusive look at this exciting new Disney Plus docuseries with executive producers and directors um, from various Marvel, uh, the Marvel universe, where they tell a uh, story showcasing the intersection of stories, storytelling, pop culture, and fandom within the Marvel universe. And that series will actually start streaming on Disney Plus on November 20th. So he, this is a little preview of it. Um, and then the next one that they're doing that day is uh, Marvel Comics celebrating 80 years of Captain America. So that's later that day. Then on Wednesday, November 18th, that's a very special day. That happens to be Mickey and Minnie's birthday. Just saying. Um, so there's two events that day. The one happens to be a, a gold member event um, at two o'clock. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a gold membership anymore. I just have a regular membership. So I can go to the 6 p.m. showing of Celebrate Mickey and Minnie on their birthday. And they're going to be doing a virtual party, which will uh, take a look at Mickey and Minnie's runaway railroad ride, which uh, railway, which is at Disney's Hollywood Studios, and a sneak peek of a new Disney Plus series called The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse. I'm just a little excited about that. Just I can saying. tell from the shirt. <laughs> you noticed. I'm so impressed. Um, and uh, the wonderful world of Mickey Mouse on Disney Plus is going to start um, on November 18th. Um, and then on Thursday, they have some Disney planning uh, panels and then an Epcot panel where they're going to be talking about all the changes that they're making to the park. Um, and then on Friday, uh, they're doing a Toy Story 25. It's amazing to think that Toy Story has been around uh, for that. So it's celebrating 25 years of Toy Story um, with an all new five facts video. Um, and then the final um, panel that they're doing, again, is the the second of the ones where you need the gold membership and it's creating fantastic worlds, a journey into Disney world building. And it's talking about going from, uh, from San Fran, um, Fran Tokyo to Wakanda to treasure cove to Mustafar, basically how they come up with everything. So that one sounds kind of cool, but again, we don't have a, a D 23 gold membership. So maybe there'll be some information you know, that comes out afterward. So kind of cool that they're doing this. Um, 
you know, I don't think this was going to be, no, 2021, I think, is supposed to be a D23 year. So at this point, we don't know if they're doing uh, D23, which is the, the convention. Uh, so at least this is something kind of cool to, to do, you know, in the meantime. So how does a D23 convention typically go down compared to what they're doing for the virtual event? Oh, well, for the for a regular D23 convention, it's what, usually four days. It's at the convention center. It's kind of almost, you know, the Disney version of Comic Con, um, where there's different panels that you attend. They usually have it sectioned off. So they'll do the Disney Legends, where they induct various people that have been part of Disney into their, you know, Disney's Hall of Fame. There'll be usually a whole parks section. That's where we, you know, usually find out all the news about all the different rides that are coming, you know, or the different resorts, any changes that they're making, um, you know, to the theme parks. Then there's usually a, a movies section where they talk about all the different you know, movies. Sometimes it's, it's Marvel. Sometimes it's Disney. Sometimes it's Pixar. Uh, then a television. So basically anything, you know, related to, to Disney usually happens, you know, at D23. They haven't really done anything, you know, outside of that. So this is kind of interesting. Now they've done D23 events because we've actually gone to, um, a couple of them where they did D23 events, you know, throughout the country in various locations. We, you know, we're fortunate enough to, to go to two of them that happened to be, um, in the Philadelphia area. Um, obviously with everything that's going on, they're not able to do any of that. So I guess this is maybe why they kind of came up with this whole week long. And I believe, uh, according to the D23 website, there's actually a second week of things that they're doing, but those are only for D23 gold members. So this one is, this week is kind of the everybody can go to where next week is a little bit more exclusive. Interesting. Very cool. Tell us why we might not be seeing Jack Sparrow anymore. So obviously if um you know one of the most beloved rides of disney theme parks is the pirates of the caribbean and whether you're boarding the classic ship at disneyland or you get to go on the most advanced version of it in shanghai there's always some you know one of the things that's always the same is that you get to see jack sparrow now well what if disney decides to now remove him so if you're a fan of Johnny Depp, you might have heard the story uh, or the, the the news that came out uh, this past week uh, that he lost a case against his ex-wife in a domestic violence dispute. Um, so because of, you know, the the case that uh, the news of the case uh, after the news broke about it. Uh, various reports, uh, came out that, uh, Johnny Depp was losing his iconic movie roles. Um, he was actually asked to step down from Warner Brothers and he actually had posted and, and let his fans know. He says, I wish to let you know that I've been asked to resign from Warner Brothers and from my role as Grindenwald in Fantastic Beats. And I respect and agree to, to that request. Uh, so now he's no longer going to be part of the Harry Potter, uh, spinoff franchise. So now, People are starting to wonder, is Disney now going to make, you know, the same kind of changes? Um, obviously, Jack Sparrow has been a part of um, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, since it started. Um, now, supposedly, he has not been asked to join the sixth Pirates of uh, the Caribbean movie that he was actually scrapped from that, I guess, but again, I don't know if that was done before this or after this. Um, and then the, you know, where else this happens was as of 2006, they actually changed 
uh, the ride in Disney World to add him as a character in the ride. They had done a, an update to the ride, had added him in a couple, couple of different places. So now could it be something where they now take him out? Now, the one thing is with the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, they make updates every couple of years anyway. And, you know, in, in some cases, the ride actually stayed the same for many years. And it wasn't until the popularity of the movie came out that they actually, you know, went in and, and kind of brought the movie to the ride where it was the ride that, you know, had the, you know, inspired the the movie. So they have gone and made various changes since the various movies have come out. So technically, you know, could it be that they're doing it just because they kind of want to not have him in the forefront or, oh, look, we have a newer movie and he's not in it. So now we can change the story of, of the ride again. So no word had come out from Disney whether or not they're removing him. But, you know, we, it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, if they did, obviously. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, he was definitely a fan favorite. The, mm -hmm. the article itself even talks about you know, a petition of 300,000 people, mm -hmm. you know, signing on to, to basically show their support for him. Mm -hmm. And he's done, you know, he's embraced the character to a level that is unusual for an actor mm -hmm. because he's even shown up in the park in right. character. Right. Unannounced, mm -hmm. not compensated for it or anything. Right. And really, you know, played up the role mm -hmm. of that character. So. Well, it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, we all, I guess we all move on at some point. Mm -hmm. right? And, and that's the other thing too, is, you know, is, is it something where give it a year and most people are going to forget what happened and, you know. Well, and, and the other thing is you look at some of the, uh, other talent that Disney has had mm -hmm. and some of the controversies that they've had right. and they've not blacklisted people right. for, for far worse than what oh you know absolutely johnny depp's going through right so right it'll be interesting to see how that mm -hmm. plays out yep so that was all we had for our disney detective mm -hmm. we'll be back in a minute with our tales from the edge of the galaxy for over seven years the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group we're family. Join us on the Starforge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Pew. Pew, pew. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Star Wars finally confirms something that we all suspected, uh, that we suspected all along. Obviously, for many decades, four, actually, um, you know, it's uh, George Lucas, you know, brought us to, you know, the galaxy far, far away uh, with the original sequel, uh, the original pre, the original trilogy. trilogy. Thank you. <laughs> I'm losing words today. Um, and obviously, you know, there are between the, the prequels and the sequels and the original uh, trilogy, 
there's all these loopholes that, you know, a lot of fans who are, are diehards like yourself, obviously, uh, are always questioning how, you know, this works and how this work, you know, that works. Um, so obviously, um, the biggest one that that, you know, kind of came up and what this article talks about is that in Star Wars Episode five, The Empire Strikes Back. Obviously, the big twist was Luke Skywalker, uh, Luke Skywalker's lineage. But also, this is where people got to visit uh, to see Yoda for the first time. And the Jedi Master was introduced to Luke as he set off to Dagobah to continue his training in the ways of the Force and doing so with his faithful droid R2-D2 in tow. Obviously, he crash landed into the swamp and the duo met this kooky old creature who turns out to be this wide old Jedi who they were looking for. So the problem, as fans see it, is that Yoda doesn't seem to recognize the droid in the moment, which is odd because they definitely share time fighting a common enemy in the Clone Wars of the prequels. And per a recent published book, however, it finally has been confirmed that Yoda did actually recognize R2-D2. Uh, so the new book that, that came out is called From a Certain Viewpoint, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, it was released in the celebration of The Empire Strikes Back's 40th anniversary. And it's essentially, it's a retelling of the film's events as seen through the eyes of secondary characters. And yes, one of those stories, which is called The First Lesson by Jim Zub, finds Yoda recounting his first meetings with the now adult Luke Skywalker, having witnessed his birth in Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. So uh, in the book, it says uh, that the meeting is at initially played for laughs in The Empire Strikes Back because Yoda is kind of putting on that crazy old alien ruse to kind of, you know, test Luke, um, who, you know, is, is going to now be his pupil. And so now we get to see it through Yoda's eyes in this in this book. And the moments unfold much differently with the cunning Jedi watching Luke from afar before acknowledging that he actually knew the droid by young Skywalker's side. So from the book, it says, carefully moving through the swamp while staying beneath the fog, Yoda soon spots the boy and even and his droid unpacking their supplies. Even though the droid was caked with algae, dirt, and stomach fluid, it appears and its appearance and familiar blips are quite recognizable. R2-D2. Of course, the boy had Anakin's old droid with him. Such cycles of fate no longer surprise the 900-year-old Jedi. So hearing this it kind of you know makes you think about it differently that yoda was just kind of playing it up that he didn't know him when in actuality he did so kind kind of interesting to to put a a different spin on it yeah well you know lucas and star wars kind of paint themselves into a corner quite frequently mm. uh they want to portray this lineage this this canonized version with continuity checks and stuff like that but when you throw the prequels in you you kind of upset the apple cart mm. yeah, there were a lot of questions of continuity that came out of the prequels that being one of the lesser ones you know one of the biggest ones that hopefully will be answered in the uh, obi-wan series is why did Obi-Wan age so much over such a short period of time? You know, he went from a man in his 30s to a man in his 60s or 70s in 15 years. So there's a lot of these continuity things in here, and I think people tend to, to hold too, try to hold too much accountable to, to what Lucas did initially and then what came afterwards. A lot of it, you have to kind of allow for a certain amount of creative mm -hmm. uh, fluidity in the story itself um, because they keep shooting themselves in the foot. I mean, you look <laughs> at stuff like Revenge of the Sith. Right. Okay, so Revenge of the Sith, 
picks up almost, you know, two years, three years, four years or so after Clone Wars, mm -hmm. and you're you're the Clone Wars start at the end of Attack of the Clones, and they end as part of uh, Revenge of the Sith. So you see that play out, and, and Anakin is still a, an apprentice of Obi-Wan and all that, blah, 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 and that's great. Then we get the Clone Wars series, and all of a sudden, we're introduced to an apprentice that Anakin is assigned who's never even mentioned in Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm. And they spent four years together, and somehow they developed this tight relationship. They're they're as tight as Obi-Wan and Anakin are. Right. But there's never a mention of her in Revenge of the Sith. There's no a mention of him having an apprentice, nothing. Right. They basically threw it in as a plot twist to keep kids interested. Hmm. And they didn't bother to explain what happened to that until this last season of Clone Wars that was just done after the series had been canceled. Mm-hmm. I really shouldn't bring my phone into the studio. Probably when we're doing not. This. Yeah. Um, so my point is, is even with the modern version of Star Wars, they continuously put themselves into this position where they have continuity error and and glaring ones, and like right, not 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 recognizing R two D two because he's caked with mud. Like I could buy the fact that, you know. Yoda's been stuck on this swamp, not seeing anybody for 15 years right, now. Right, and he's going, you know, delusional. Right. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this guy and this droid, which the droids are generic. They're, they're right, portrayed gonna... in the story as generic. Right. So the fact that you don't recognize it because Obi-Wan Kenobi didn't recognize him either. And nobody ever explained that one from mm. A New Hope. So, like... This well, is and and that's now saying that how did he maybe he did maybe he was acting all well I guess my point yeah. is you know I can buy the fact that that he didn't right I don't need someone to explain that away at this point it right doesn't, it doesn't change the story for me mm -hmm. the problem that I have is that they're continuously creating these continuity errors that are far more glaring than this. So go and fix the other ones first. Right. <laughs> we'll stop introducing them first of all, <laughs> and then fix the ones that are more significant than this one. But you know, it, it's it's revisionist history, basically, is mm -hmm. what it is when they do this. But I, I guess it keeps somebody employed, right? Right. It's another book to go by. Speaking of revisionist history, here's another book we can go by. <laughs> let's let's talk about. How Lucas revised history himself. So George Lucas obviously went back and changed the original Star Wars trilogy. And it seems that the reason why is because he was kind of embarrassed. Uh, so George Lucas has revealed why he went back and tinkered with A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi in a new uh, coffee table book called The Star Wars Archives, 1999 to 2005. Uh, the Star Wars creator revealed that there were two or three shots that were just really bad from the original Star Wars movie, and it was, and he felt that he was going to be judged on that, um, and that he was just embarrassed, um, and that in 1993, <clears throat> excuse me, when the 20th anniversary was coming up, he decided to do a special edition of A New Hope to kind of bring it up to the standards that he was aiming for. Uh, so he points out that obvious, you know, one of the scenes was when the stormtrooper was riding the dewback during the extended Mos Eisley scene. Uh, it was something that he wanted to include and just do justice to the scene. But at the time, and we've heard this before, the technology just wasn't available available to do some of these shots and that's why he decided to go back and, and change it he said nobody uh ever really finishes their movie they're abandoned and i was just not happy with a new hope i um was still mixing and we were still uh sticking shots in after the movie came out so again his movie he could do what he wants 
but he was, I guess it, it's one of those things, hey, if I have a chance to, to go back and, and redo it, you know, go ahead and do it. Obviously, you have the people with hand shot first who, you know, those people, why'd you have to change that? And then, of course, the whole ghost scene of, of Return of the Jedi, adding, you know, Hayden Christensen. Um, why'd you have to go in and change that? So, you know, again, his, pro- you know, prerogative, his movie, but something See, for us and- to... You know, I have a hard up. time buying that logic because this would be like going back and changing works of art. You know, mm-hmm. what if Da Vinci kept t- retouching the Mona Lisa, you know, and, and she winds up being a completely different painting. It's one of those things where you did something and it is what it is. Let it stand for the test of time. Mm-hmm. It was such an iconic film right? that that film in its original form is in the Library of Congress. That alone should tell you that you can't touch it at that point in time because it's not yours. At that point, it's owned by the people. It's owned Mm -hmm. by the fans. And I wouldn't be totally against fixing things, you know, but he went back and he changed things that were, were vital character development plot twists. You know, the hand shot first. When you saw what Han did with Greedo, that defined a character right there. You didn't need a tre- a, 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 a prequel for him. You didn't need a, a, a Han Solo movie. You didn't know that he I knew wanted he was to be a, a pilot? I knew he was a pilot already. But that, <laughs> that one act mm. defined that character. Then you have other things like the Sarlacc. Okay, so they added tentacles to the Sarlacc. That worked. Mm. You didn't change the scene. You right. didn't change any characters. You didn't. Right. You didn't mess anything up. You added something to it. Mm-hmm. Then you have the Jabba scene. Mm-hmm. So they had originally shot Jabba with a short, fat guy in a furry costume. See, that could have been your cosplay. And they cut him from right. the movie, and then Jabba doesn't show up again until uh, Return of the Jedi, and right. he's a slug. Right. And the problem was they tried to reuse that film, so they digitally edited it. Right. And it looked ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Jabba's literally a third of the size that he is in Return of the Jedi. Well, also, and he's CGI. He's totally CGI, so you can see how fake he is. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's a point where, in the original scene, Han Solo walks around the human character that's there. Right. So in order to do that on a slug... He'd have to step on him. And he does. And Jabba makes this goofy face. They shift Han Solo up real quick. And it just, it looks so terrible the way they did it. Mm. And they took Jabba, who was this mean, bad, a gangster guy who you're supposed to be afraid of. Right. And they turned it into a comedic piece. Mm. And they ruined the character. Um, you did get to see Boba Fett, which was kind of cool, but he did nothing other than nod his head. So it's it's things like that where you're making changes, like the Death Star attack. So he went back and he digitally added a bunch of other X-Wings to make the battle look bigger. Okay, that's cool. That worked. Mm-hmm. You didn't change anybody. Right. So some of the changes you're okay with, others you're not. The, the enhancements I'm okay with. Okay. The, the whole Pulling Sebastian Stan out, of uh, Sebastian Saw, Saw, uh, Shaw out as Anakin from the ghost scene was was terrible. Not, right. run, not only are you disrespecting the actor who's no longer alive by pulling him out because he had the credit in the scene, mm-hmm. but you're sticking Anakin in at a different point in his development and you miss the entire meaning mm-hmm. of the entire movie. Right. The movie is called Return of the Jedi. Right. So you cannot put a young version of Darth Vader or Anakin Skywalker in there who had been the evil one. Right. You had to put the one who had learned his lesson, Mm -hmm. who had come full circle, who was the older Darth Vader. Right. So by doing that, you're changing the entire outcome of the movie. And it's a disaster. So my my point is, if you're going to go back and tweak things, Fix the cell because because if you look if you look at the original version, the way they green screened the Tie Fighters attacks and stuff like that, you mm-hmm. can see the cells around them 
from the special effects. Right. Clean that up. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Right, right. Add more ships in. Make the scene, the most likely scene, look bigger with more aliens. That's fine. You're not changing the, the substance of the movie. Mm-hmm. But when you go back and you change how characters develop, you, then you're ruining the characters. You're changing the movie. You can't change the plot. You want to clean it up. You want to recolorize it. You want to digitize it and make it look better with modern technology. That's fine. That's no different than taking the Mona Lisa and doing a forensic restore to get all the gunk from 200 years off of her. I'm okay with that. But he's going back and he's painting a different hairstyle on the Mona Lisa. And he's painting a different smile on the Mona Lisa and putting glasses on her with the funny nose and stuff. That's what he's doing to try to make it look better. And if someone did that to the Mona Lisa, it would be a crime. They'd be thrown in jail. So how do you get away with doing that to a, a classic movie like Star Wars? So now George Lucas has to go to jail. George Lucas should <laughs> oh, George Lucas should have been thrown in jail after the holiday special. <laughs> you know, it's taken 40 years to try to correct that. <laughs> Which comes out in a couple of weeks, just saying. Which does come out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I love how passionate you get <laughs> Your Star Wars. It's my Star Wars, man. I know. It's, you know, it's funny. Just as an aside, (laughs) I was having a discussion with my son, Sam, about some of the the Star Wars stuff and how the Mandalorian, how the Mandalorian is being done differently than other Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And and I told him, I said, it's a testament to the fact that you have these these directors that are that are taking it and dirt. They're bending the rules a little bit. They're taking it in a different direction. And he had a lot of praise to put on Dave Filoni, which he totally deserves. Mm -hmm. But my point to him was Dave Filoni, if he was producing The Mandalorian, it'd be a very different show. If he was directing it, rather. It would be a very different show. Um, The fact that they have different directors for each show shows you the diversity of the episodes. Mm -hmm. Dave Filoni directing it and putting his spin on it would be like me do- doing it. I couldn't do a good job. I couldn't do what they're doing with the Mandalorian because of how much of a traditionalist I am. Mm, okay. So is Dave Filoni. Right. Both Filoni and, and John Favreau are passionate fans of the genre, just like I am. So there's a certain standard that they adhere to. But then you have people like Taika Watiti who come in and they put those creative edges on and they make the episodes so rich mm-hmm. and different. And if a traditionalist like me was doing it, we wouldn't break those boundaries. We wouldn't cross those lines and you wouldn't get as good a product. Mm. So my point to, to Sam was I couldn't do as good a job at Mandalorian as is being done with it right now. And it's because of this passion. You know, I couldn't do a Star Wars special edition. I wouldn't do a Star Wars special edition. (gasps) There are lines that Lucas crossed in doing the special edition that should not have been crossed. Mm -hmm. And they weren't crossed for creative reasons. They were crossed crossed for egotistical reasons. And for merchandising reasons. And for merchandising reasons. So, yeah, that passion is you know, what guides me in my opinion here, but I recognize the limitations that I would have if I was put in a creative role doing these types of things. I could not do, I could do maybe one out of every five Mandalorian episodes because about one out of every five is a very traditional Star Wars Mm -hmm. episode. Those are the ones that I'd be comfortable with. I could do those and I could do those with, you know, do justice to those. The first episode of the season is a great uh, example of that, where they brought back R5. Right. And you had that tie-in to the traditional, and there was a perfect explanation as to why he would be around. You know, Filoni went through and made sure that they repainted him red so he would fit the... Right. That's the kind of thing that I would do Mm -hmm. for that level of continuity. I would probably have never done this last episode that we saw because it was just so out in left field Mm -hmm. you know it was it was a great episode Mm -hmm. but it broke a lot of the boundaries that that happened in a star wars film so you know that's sort of the limitations that i have to understand with the passions that i have 
But anyway, that's all we have for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Pew, pew. Uh, we'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Back with our entertainment news of the week. So this was a, a cute little story that, that came out. Um, so it was uh, the popular Marvel character that Stanley forgot he created. Um, so it's hard to imagine that Stanley has now been gone for two years. On November 12th, 2018, the world you know, was shook when Lee, who was the co-creator of some of the most popular fictional characters of all time, like Spider-Man, Iron Man, and the X-Men, had passed away at the age of 95. He obviously helped to make Marvel the entertainment juggernaut that it is today and wrote some of, you know, the best comic book stories ever made. Um, now, obviously, he didn't create all of the characters. Um, he didn't create Luke Cage or Venom uh, or Wolverine, just to name a few. But sometimes he actually kind of forgot some of the other characters that uh, he created. So recently, Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn took to Twitter to tell fans a quick little antidote about how Lee forgot that he had created one of the most popular characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So on November 12th, uh, Gunn honored the comic book legend with these kind words. One of the greatest joys of my life was getting to know Stan Lee and working with him on multiple occasions. He was a wonderful guy and a true role model outside of all he was given to the world and me personally, creatively. It's hard to believe it's been two years since he's gone. Gunn followed up the post with noting an exchange that he had had with Lee. He says, I still remember him telling me how much he loved the first Guardians film, even though he didn't create them. Gunn said, you created Groot, I told him. Did I, he said. He had forgotten achievements that would sustain other creatives for a lifetime. I miss you, Stan. Nuff said. So to be fair, Lee actually co-created lots of characters, and it had been well over 50 years since he had come up with Groot. So Lee, along with uh, Larry Leiber, Jack Kirby, and Dick Ayers, had put the first monster to paper in Tales to Astonish, uh, number 13, all the way back in November of 1960. So Groot's been, <laughs> been around a while. So I guess you can kind of, you know, make sense that he, he forgot him. Um, and obviously Groot, you know, is known for saying, I am Groot, that, that that's all he says. So a cute little story, obviously, uh, about, you know, Stan Lee, who still has an impact, you know, even to this day. And, you know, obviously a lot, a lot of characters, I'm sure, you know, if he had to sit and name every single one, he'd probably, you know, miss a few. So, well, and that's an impressive feat. The fact that you've been so creative. I mean, the man was 95 years old when he passed away. Mm -hmm. You've been so creative for so long and created so many iconic characters that you can forget mm -hmm. ones that you've created that, you know, you might have one, a typical comic creator might have two or three iconic characters mm -hmm. they create. Right. And Groot would have been one of those ones that you could have made a career out of. 
and he had so many that he forgot that he even created it. Mm -hmm. I, I can only imagine how many others he created that he didn't remember that he oh, created yeah. over yeah. the years. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, that's that's how much of an impact Stan Lee had on the comic world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So two years later, still missed. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Orville. So it looks like the Orville is now returning to production. So obviously, slowly but surely, various shows and movies ha have started uh, ramping up production. Um, in this article, it talks about Star Trek Discovery uh, starting production uh, last week in Toronto. It looks like Picard is set to start their second season in January, uh, filming in Southern California. And now it looks like the Orville will be uh, starting back up in December. Um, the shooting of the third season actually had started in October of 2019, and they were actually a, about almost halfway done at the time that the coronavirus hit and that they had to stop. Uh, so according to a source with the production, cameras will start rolling again the first week of December. Prep work has actually restarted, um, and some of the people have already started showing up on the Fox lot in Century City, California. Most of the cast and crew are actually expected to be on set after Thanksgiving to start rehearsals and pickup shots, and that they're hoping to start production again um, in December and going, um, you know, until Christmas. They'll take a break and then restart again in early January. Um, obviously, it's taking a little bit longer now to produce things because of the strict COVID protocols that are in place where, you know, normally it would maybe only take, you know, three months to do something. Now it's, you know, taking between five and six months uh, to pr produce things. Um, the other thing too, is that there's no target date yet for when uh, the season three is going to be debut, but we do know that there will be 11 episodes, um, each of which will have a longer airtime because they're now going to be on, on Hulu. So they don't have the restrictions like they did when they were on Fox, um, on broadcast television. So the episodes are going to be a little bit longer and they're able to kind of branch off into other topics that they couldn't do while they were on broadcast television. Um, so it should be interesting to, to see when it finally comes out. They're hoping if they can f finish filming, you know, sometime in the beginning of the year that the new episodes will be uh, launched on Hulu before the end of 2021. Well, that's cool. At least it's moving along. It's one of our uh, our favorite shows we like to watch. And now that we found out we actually have Hulu. <laughs> now, now, that we, yeah, now that we do have Hulu. Thanks now to we can watch cellular, it. <laughs> so, uh, provider. Yay. Um, no, no word on whether uh, Seth MacFarlane is going to continue, though. Yeah, because that was one of the stories that we talked about a couple of weeks ago um, was that they were going to kill off his character, that he was kind of done with it. But no, they in this article, it talked about how that this, you know, this series is actually he's very passionate about it. It's, you know, he's a very big sci fi fan, a very obviously it's it's very much an homage to Next Generation. So, you know, this well, article and, and in the art, the article we had uh, talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, he had expressed interest in doing some more legitimate drama type stuff. Right, right. And the show itself from season one to season two started out really more as a comedy mm -hmm. and evolved into a much more serious mm -hmm. drama Yeah, as it moved on by the end of season two. So yeah. maybe that's giving him that fix that he wants. Maybe we maybe, get a few yeah. more seasons you know, with him at the helm, and, so to speak. Right. And maybe with, you know, and, and maybe also because of it now going to the streaming service, now being able to do a little bit more serious, sure. not prime time yeah, stuff. Yeah, and we've seen stuff like that happen with mm -hmm. The Expanse, for instance, right. when it moved from, from prime time to right. uh, streaming. So 
Hopefully it'll so work. maybe it'll keep his interest and, you know, he won't kill off his character. Yeah. Uh, that's it for our entertainment news. We'll be that right back it. with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. My insightful pick this week is actually the Netflix version of a podcast that I didn't even know was was around. Um, so the name of the documentary is called Song Exploder. Um, and there uh, is volume one, which is out now, uh, features uh, one, two, three, four, four episodes to to this. Um, volume two is actually going to be coming out on December 15th, I just found out. Um, it's a very interesting show. Obviously, it, it's the the documentary is basically the podcast but in visual form really is what it, it comes out so the song exploder is a podcast where musicians take apart their songs and piece by piece tell the story of how they were made so each episode is produced and edited by the host and creator um i'm gonna try not to butcher his name it's rush kashesh rush hakesh uh uh, here way, higher way. Um, and he's actually a musician, um, and has obviously this, this huge love of, of music. And so what he does is by using isolated individual tracks from the recording, he asks the artist to kind of delve into spe uh, specific decisions that went into creating their work. Um, he edits the interviews by removing his side of the conversation and condensing the story in a tightly focused uh, you know, where it's focused more on how the artist brought their song to life. Um, I think he has, I think it was like 300, no, uh, uh, like 150 episodes of his podcast. And basically every kind of artist from rap to country to pop to R&B, um, you know, some of his guests included uh, Fleetwood Mac, U2, Metallica, Lord, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, Carly Rae Jepsen. Um, in the Netflix documentary, um, the three that I've watched uh, was uh, Alicia Keys, Lin-Manuel Miranda, which you watched with me, as well as R.E.M., which you watched with me. And it was just kind of fascinating because they really just focus on one song and they just kind of break it down and afterwards when they play the song in its entirety you feel completely different about it you you have almost a better understanding of of what that artist wanted to portray in that song so i thought the you know uh the documentary was very well done and now that i know that it's a podcast it's one of those things i might actually you know, go back and start listening to to various episodes to kind of see, you know, how he he does it in just you know the audio form. Cool, good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is not a documentary. Actually, my pick this week is one that folks at out of a couple of sci fi fans at work who have been. Uh, leaning on me to watch for a while now. We are two episodes into The Boys on Amazon Prime uh, of season one right now. And uh, I think we're going to stick with it because it's a pretty good show. Mm -hmm. The Boys is an irreverent take on what happens when superheroes who are as popular as celebrities, as influential as politicians, and as revered as gods abuse their superpowers rather than use them for good. It's the powerless against the super powerful as the boys embark on a heroic quest to expose the truth about the seven and their formidable vault backing. Uh, this is a graphic show. <laughs> to say the least. Uh, it is not meant for children. Oh, no. <laughs> it is not a uh, substitute for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. No, 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 no. Uh, no. <laughs> it is... Basically, everything you could possibly imagine going wrong with superheroes 
and more. Mm-hmm. It's a very well done show. Keith Urban is brilliant in the role that he plays. Yeah. yeah. It's very well produced. Mm -hmm. uh, they obviously have a decent budget for this film because it's it shows. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely worth a watch. We're very early in. And right. We, we're we're late to the game. We're definitely because like, you know, you were saying I had friends at work that I'd hear them starting to talk about it. And it definitely sounded like it was something that we would both enjoy. And I know we've been wanting to start it and just haven't gotten around to it because there were other things to watch. And now we're definitely both both fans and we, we are definitely hooked <laughs> and we sit and go oh 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 yeah oh let's very, watch it again <laughs> very creative ways to kill superheroes yep that's for sure. <laughs> that is true uh so that is the boys on amazon prime the first two seasons are currently available for streaming and uh we'll be right back So I think that was all we had today. Did you have any afterthoughts you wanted to go over? No, I think I'm good. All right. Uh, before we go, I would invite folks to check out our long form articles on medium at medium.com slash insights into things. You can listen to our audio podcast as insights in entertainment. We are available on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and Amazon. Our video podcasts are listed on our Insights into Things. Uh, you'll also get videos of our other shows, Insights into Tomorrow and Insights into Teens there as well. To contact us, you can reach out to us on email at comments at insightsintothings.com. Or you can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you also have a Twitch Prime subscription available for free. We would greatly appreciate your support for the show. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are insights into things. Uh, sorry, it <laughs> threw me off the way you said. Our audio versions where you can hear all my flub ups are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can get our uh, high res videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And obviously, you can go to the website, which has all of our links, all of our show notes, and other things at uh, insightsintothings.com. And I think that's it. That is it. Another one in the book. Have a good week, everyone. Bye.